Awesome. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I would be lying if I said I were not extremely humbled to be up here. Uh, Brenda Rubenstein and I, who you just heard speaking before Lauren, went to Columbia and she was wildly intelligent. So I'm feeling you know, slightly small in comparison. Um, before I start, I should tell you a little bit about myself. I'm originally from Austin, Texas, which is the best city in the United States, hands down, for all things barbecue and Tex-Mex, which are the best cuisines on the planet. Uh, very strong opinions about that. I then, uh, at the time, thought it would be really cool to move to New York City, where I thought I would live like Carrie Bradshaw in Sex and the City. Turns out, does not happen on a graduate student stipend, a huge mistake I made, but learned it anyway. After that, I had the good fortune to be picked up by the Novartis Computer Aided Drug Discovery Group, where I worked for an amazing uh, man who's heavily involved in the ACS, Dr. Lewis Whitehead, and also went back and forth between Yale University, where I worked with Professor Bill Jorgensen. Awesome, super supportive team. And I got to live in Boston and have all of the resources of working in industry, but also have the, the Yale cred. So it was, it was honestly the sweetest deal I've ever hooked up for myself. So it was, it was great. And after that, I decided, you know what? I, I felt like I, I had gone into my postdoc, and I had learned what I wanted to learn. Um, and, and I sort of jumped ship, actually, earlier than a lot of people expected me to, because I felt like, and I still feel like, the job of a postdoc is to get a job. So I did that, I published my papers, and then I went on to work for a software company called Schrodinger, where I worked for a few years. And then I thought again, you know, I feel like I've learned what I wanted to learn here. And so I started looking around for other opportunities, and I was not a in my classes in biology. So going to a company like Moderna was absolutely not what I was thinking. But somebody sent me a job posting from Moderna and said, I think this is a really good fit for you. And I was like, what are you talking about? They would never hire somebody like me. And I go in for my interview, and I interview with our president at the time. And he says to me, well, what do you know about messenger RNA? I was like, uh, I don't know, there's like a five prime something. He's like, that's yeah, fine, you'll learn. So it's extremely ironic that I'm up here talking to you about this today. And in fact, I've even been told that now I talk too much like a biologist for chemistry audiences. So this, I think, is really pointing to what Paula mentioned before about being comfortable getting out of your zone, being comfortable failing, right? Jumping into other fields. My first two years at Moderna, I was the only chemist in the room with all of these biologists, and I didn't understand 99% of the words they said. And so I'd have my phone under the table and be like Googling all of their acronyms hoping they wouldn't see. And so that leads us to where we are today. And I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I do at Moderna, specifically in the area of rational structure-based design of mRNAs. So ironically, I'm going to be up here as the total dunce in biology telling you about the central dogma, where we know that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then processed by the ribosome and translated into proteins. And this is a convenient backdrop against which to also talk about the biotech explosion of the last few decades. For example, you've heard numerous talks about protein biologics, clearly a very big field. Also, uh, we heard one talk mentioning CRISPR-Cas9 gene therapy, obviously an extremely exciting area as well. But what about RNA, right? At the time Moderna was founded, there were no RNA-based therapies on the market. And now there's only one FDA-approved drug, and that's by our friends at El Nylum, and that's Patisaran. And that's for something called RNAi, a little itty-bitty RNA. But what if mRNA could be a drug? How could that be different? And could that change the field and the way we think about things? Well, why would we want to do this? Well, really what we're trying to do is hack into the native processes. So in your body right now, you have your DNA being transcribed into mRNA, which is then exported to your cytosol. It interacts with the ribosome and then goes on to make numerous different proteins for numerous different functions. That sounds great, but all of this is limited to your native, your endogenous genes. What if we could sort of sneak in some non-native, some synthetic genes, and suddenly hijack the same machinery, get this 
particle into your cells, have it believe that the messenger RNA is native, and then treat it as if it is and start to translate all of these different proteins. You can think of this as sort of intermediate between traditional gene therapies, which you know, go in and actually have to you know, get inside and recode the, the genetic material, except it's transient because it's messenger RNA. And you can also think of it as intermediate between gene therapy and protein biologics, where what we're able to do is for hopefully every mRNA, we get large bang for our buck, where we generate lots and lots and lots of proteins for every little bit that we do dose. So we thought, before I joined the company, that this sounded like a really potentially interesting both business and healthcare opportunity. But it's really hard. And it's really hard for a few reasons. You've heard a lot today about delivery. Delivery is a huge challenge for messenger RNA because it's really big and it has to somehow get into your cells. Your cells don't want to do that without provocation. The other thing is, what do we know of that is nucleic acid based that tries to sneak its way into your cells? Viruses, right? So your body is set up to freak out any time exogenous genetic material tries to invade. We have to somehow avoid that and make sure that our messenger RNA therapeutics do not trigger an immune response. And finally, even if we get past those two, we have to make sure that the messenger RNA is translated by the ribosome into protein. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. So all three of these make this a staggeringly difficult problem. And I don't have time to talk to you about the other facets of this, immunity and translation. I'm giving another talk later today because it's a long day. If you want to know, come to that talk. But for the sake of time, I'm only going to talk to you today about the work that my team and I are doing in delivery. So I mentioned Petisaran from our friends at Alnylam, the only FDA-approved uh, RNA-based drug out there. The scientists at Al Nylum have done an amazing job of pioneering how to get little RNAs, siRNAs, into cells. This is really non-trivial. They spent lots of time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears getting this little guy across this membrane. Now I want you to think about what we're trying to do. This is a messenger RNA. It is huge. It is two orders of magnitude longer than siRNA. It's highly charged, and somehow we got to get this bugger across the membrane. So how do we do that? Well, we take a page out of Al Nylum's book, and then we have to do all sorts of things to make it different. But the page that we took out of their book was using lipid nanoparticles, LNPs. So these look, for all practical purposes, like low-density lipoprotein or very low-density lipoprotein that's floating around in your body after you, say, binge at McDonald's. So they're just, I like to call them squishy lipid meatballs. And they're made up of a number of different standard components. For example, some lipids, then something called polyethylene glycol, PEG, on the surface, which is, if you believe the dogma, to confer stealth properties. And then, of course, what would the particle be without the cargo itself? And it's often drawn in cartoon representation like this. And when I came to Moderna and after I started, worked with the biologist for a few years. I started thinking more about delivery, and I kept looking at these cartoons that were everywhere and thinking, that doesn't really make sense. I mean, how, how do we know that they actually look like that? And so I kept looking into the literature, and turns out, I get this question all the time, what does a lipid nanoparticle look like? And my answer is, we don't know. And so if we don't really know what a lipid nanoparticle looks like, how do we design it? And so that leads to the next thing. So, how is lipid nanoparticle design done traditionally? Well, what we do is we take all of those same components, and then we can make any number of changes. You know, change the chemistries, change the processes, use a vortex mixer versus a tea mixer, all of these different levers that you can pull. And you make the particle, you put it in, for example, some mice, and then you see what happens. And this is an extremely laborious and time-intensive process. And so we find ourselves frustrated. And the, the poor chemical engineers, I mean, they, they were working to, to the bone to try to figure this out because largely the principles underlying this are a black box. And so I came in to the problem and you know, being a chemist by training, I thought, well, this isn't a black box. Really, what you're thinking, what, what you need, what the missing link is, is just the structure. Right? If we knew what the structure of a lipid nanoparticle was, we could start to think about structure-function relationships, something that chemists love to think about, myself included. 
But again, we don't know what they look like. You know, maybe we have a cute cartoon here that's kind of representative, we tell ourselves. Or maybe the lipid nanoparticle is really, really amorphous. Maybe it's highly ordered. Maybe it's like an onion with many layers of lipid all compacted together. We just don't know. And so my team and I, along with uh, some experimental colleagues, set out to derive the relationship between lipid nanoparticle structure and their function. And this is an insanely ambitious project where we're using basically every biophysical technique under the sun. And one technique that we're really pioneering is the use of computational modeling. So modeling lipid nanoparticles is kind of a suicide mission, and I'll explain why. This is that same cartoon I keep showing you for a lipid nanoparticle, and this is a very short all atoms molecular dynamics simulation of just one of our ionizable lipids. So just one, and I want you to see how dynamic it is, how many degrees of freedom there are. Okay, that's one lipid. Now consider the size scale of a lipid nanoparticle to that single lipid. So there's that lipid, two nanometers in diameter. Here's your lipid nanoparticle, 80 nanometers in diameter, generally. And it consists of tens of thousands of different components. And I'm not even talking about the water molecules that are around it, other solvents, other excipients, other counter ions, or the air uh, in the vial in which it's stored. So this is an extremely complex system. And when I thought about studying this computationally, uh, I think my boss thought I was crazy. And I went to him a few times and eventually started to wear him down. And the way we were able to finally convince him and management above that we could do this was by saying that we, we wouldn't model this using conventional modeling techniques. So that same simulation that I just showed you before is done using uh, what is standardly called the all atom representation. So this is where we represent molecules the same way you would have done in organic chemistry class when you built ball and stick models. What we do instead is make approximations, and this is referred to as coarse grain molecular dynamics, where you can see we're preserving all the same qualitative characteristics of this molecule, but also reducing its complexity to allow us to simulate larger and more complex systems on more reasonable timescales. And so everything that I'm going to talk to you about today is using coarse grain molecular dynamics. So in collaboration with one of our departments called Technical Development, the head of which is here, hi, Hari, uh, we started looking at lipid nanoparticle assembly and maturation. And what the engineers were able to do is arrest lipid nanoparticle growth at different time points t. So we have time here on the x-axis and then the diameter on the y-axis. And so what they did is they had this flow reaction and then they would take the vial and quickly, quickly, quickly run it over to the dynamic light scattering instrument and measure its size. And I'm gonna change the scale of this to emphasize something. At the earliest time point they were able to measure and the particles that we were able to characterize, they looked something like this, which is remarkably similar to the mature lipid nanoparticle. So what that tells us is there's an awful lot happening in this very early regime that I argue dictates the fate of the lipid nanoparticle. It's all signed, sealed, and delivered here. So unfortunately, without insights into these early time stages, this was a black box. And this makes optimization of lipid nanoparticles, of their structure, of their function, extremely difficult. So what we decided to do was investigate this. We wanted to look at this really early time scale. And we're able to do this, of course, with molecular dynamics. So this is a simulation run by a guy on my team, Dariush, who's wildly talented. He's the expert in coarse grain simulations of lipids. So we were extremely happy to get him. And what this looks like right now, before I run the movie, is a big random gobbly mess. And that's because it is. This is T0. We're intentionally starting this at a random configuration because we want to simulate as closely as possible what's happening in the giant skids that the manufacturing engineers use. All of the components of this simulation are shown as colored over here on the right. And you'll notice that for starters, we're using an RNA oligomer. And that's because for technical reasons, it is very imprudent to try to simulate full length mRNA. So we're starting small and building up as we gain confidence. All right, uh, and this does have water and counter ions, but they're not shown. 
So let's see what happens. So within 300 nanoseconds, so let's think about that, 300 times 10 to the negative nine seconds, so you know, that, but faster, we're already getting lipid, lipid coalescence according to the hydrophobic effect. This makes sense, we're starting to see my cells. Okay, what else happens? Well, the simulation will proceed, and at one microsecond, again, one times 10 to the negative sixth seconds, like that, but faster, we are getting now appreciably spherical micelles and RNA, the little orange guys, are associated. And when I first saw this, I, I kind of started to panic. And, and I said, no, 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 something has to be wrong. Uh, the RNA has to be inside. That's the whole premise. You know, the RNA isn't protected from the environment unless it's inside. And so I want to emphasize this simulation at this point already took a month. So you can imagine the panic going on, like this is a month of work. But on a, on a whim, he ran it further, and that RNA eventually gets encapsulated. And so this is the first time anyone, to our knowledge, has ever seen the mechanism of how RNA gets encapsulated into these lipid nanoparticles and gives us fundamental insights on how we can continue to optimize our lipid nanoparticles to have that really important protective ability. And so the simulation will continue to proceed, and things that your chemical intuition would tell you should happen, happen. Uh, lipids continue to coalesce according to the hydrophobic effect. Every now and then, the particles will sort of, you know, say hello to each other. Sometimes they're shy and bounce away. Sometimes, however, they like each other because they will get stuck by that. So this is an RNA molecule, which at physiological pH is anionic, bounding, binding together two cationic LMPs. So here we can see the electrostatic interaction being the glue that holds them together. But if we watch this even further, the RNA actually slips out and does not get internalized. So understanding the process of internalization is currently the biggest challenge that we're looking at now. But we're encouraged by these preliminary results. And just for fun, let's watch the encapsulation again. There it goes. It gets swallowed into the lipid nanoparticle. Again, something that we had no idea how it happened before. And this was the first thing that we saw that we were like, oh, finally it makes sense. Something we would have never gotten without these simulations. And so I want to wrap up by saying what we've been able to do is shed critical insights into this black box regime where we are looking at just the first few microseconds. And understanding now that really the fate of the lipid nanoparticle is written so, so early. And by understanding these first few microseconds, we are already implementing process changes that help us drive later towards more functional and ideal lipid nanoparticles. And I wanna emphasize that it isn't just delivery, this is a holistic problem that we have to tackle in at all three areas. And we're doing that in our group with various different computational methods. And we're doing this because if you tackle all three of these, these make up a platform, right? You can make messenger RNA that is highly delivered without triggering an immune response that is highly translated by the ribosome. And if you pin that down, you can now drug a patient with any number of different proteins. This is like biologics on steroids. And so this is why we focus so intently over here to enable all of our different therapeutic areas. And finally, I'll close by acknowledging both my team and my management line who have been wildly supportive, even if they think that I'm sometimes crazy. And I also want to support my, or also want to acknowledge my mentor at Novartis and Yale and you, my family, my partner for showing up. But before I close, I want to make one personal note, which is that I am standing up here as a woman in science in a very male-dominated field, and that has not been easy. It has not been an easy journey, and I have experienced a lot of sexual harassment. And I almost bailed on science. I almost went and got an MBA instead because I thought I would have to. And it is only because of the support of the community and friends that I have that I'm up here speaking to you. And so for every woman that you see like me that's still here, there's scores who are not here. And so I would ask you as a community and as leaders to think about how we can shape the environment. Echoing what Paula said earlier, it is on us 
to make sure that we are creating the right environment, both for our scientists and for the culture. And so thank you very much for your time. I'd be happy to take questions.